Why is that? I don't know. I was trying to do it on my phone and that might be my issue. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to just make sure that, yep, we're recording, so that's good. <coughs> we don't know what class we're recording to, but we're recording, right? So if I forget, right, it's spring of 16 is what I recorded it to. So if I forget and have to email somebody and ask them, you'll, I'll know. Now that I've told you, I'll remember, though. Um, so where we're at is we're going to head into Chapter 9, and um, I feel like I could probably turn it over to Miranda and Austin, and you guys could just teach this, right, after having your quality class over <laughs> across the way. <laughs> They're not saying yes. I don't know. <laughs> I think it, I think that will be pretty. It'll be a pretty easy chapter for you too, because it's just an <coughs> overview of quality, and we're going to take it at a fairly high level. We're just going to want to um, make sure that everybody coming out has a good understanding of um, kind of the foundations. Some of the foundations, again, these two are having a whole course in quality, and you can do that. There's no doubt about it. Um, and so what we're going to do is just hit some of the key points. Um, we're going to talk about Deming today. You guys have probably heard of Deming. And those of you that have had Management 350 have probably also heard of Deming. And then um, we're going to, on Thursday, we're going to go into um, process control. Okay? And just to kind of frame it up, process control is about whether your production equipment runs consistently. right? And, it, and then on the following Tuesday, and we may hit it on Thursday, but I think on the following Tuesday we'll hit process capability, which is about does your production equipment, now that it's in control, does it do what your customer wants, right? And those are two different concepts, right? Just because your production equipment can do, can can stay in control, it doesn't mean that meets your customer satisfaction requirements, okay? And so process control is about what does the equipment do? And process capability is about does you does what you do and what you produce meet your customer requirements? And if you notice, um, some of you may have noticed I took down all the chapter nine assignments, and I need to rework them just slightly because in semesters past I've pulled forward from a different text to use. But what I found is, in particular for the online students, that got really confusing because they would do the try to do the homework based off of our textbook as opposed to the chapter material that I was providing. And I'm just going to go back and use our textbook because um, it it's not that huge of a difference. Um, it's just the other material. I thought the the information that they presented was maybe a little bit better, and so I'm just going to tweak what what we use to incorporate the, concept, the conceptual part of that, but use the formulas from this textbook. That way, we're just, everybody's on the same page. And what Austin and Miranda might find is the formulas that we use might be slightly different than what you've used, and they're all kind of based around, um, you know, the standard deviation, right? And so it's just dependent on how people present that particular piece of the puzzle. And so, um, anyway, it, it should all come together for us. So today, I'm going to rewrite the assignment for today to just be about the conceptual part that we're going to talk about today. Then the 9A problems that were out there are going to become 9B, and the 9B uh, problems are going to become 9C. And so I just have some tweaking to do on those to make sure that we um, are where we need to be with those assignments. Right? And then we'll come back on the following Thursday, so April 27th, and we'll take the last exam in here, which will only be over chapters 8 and 9. Right? We covered material from chapter 6 and 7, but that was just background information for those projects that, had, that needed to have reference to that. And then on Tuesday, May 2nd, I say it's an in-class project workday, but what you need to know is I'm traveling to Seattle that day, so I will not be here. So if you have questions about your project, you'll have to email them to me, or you'll have to meet with me before I leave on that Monday. And so I'll be gone, excuse me, I'll be leaving on that Tuesday. Mm. And then I come back the following Monday. So um, I have two conferences that I'm attending in Seattle over that week, and uh, they're both really good. So... Um, so that's kind of our, and then um, we'll do those uh, presentations um, on the project after that. I think that today we do have time to um, take a quick look at Part D of the project. Um, and so I was just going to bring up kind of what's out there. Um, so Part D is where you're just kind of finishing up with flow rate and capacity analysis. So you've had the exam over Chapter 5. You should have pretty good um, understanding of the conceptual part of that. Um, 
So the most common mistake in this area is to average across processes and resources rather than use your weighted averages. So don't forget if you've got two different types of flow units to use the weighted averages um, and the artificial flow unit to provide more accurate information about what you're working on. So be sure to evaluate the assumptions and method of your approach to make sure it fits with the information you're providing. Do those gut checks, right? As you're reading through what your, put, what your output is, go, okay, yeah, that makes sense, or no, it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then you should stop and ask why and, and try to get that figured out. Um, in this part, I say incorporate subprocess mapping if you need it or rework and visits. I, at this point, I don't think there's anybody that I had that on their feedback because most everybody already had it in if they needed it in, okay? Um, de de develop a table similar to table 5.1 indicating your effective capacity for your identified resource pools. So again, who are your resource pools or what are your resources that you need, right? And then calculate their effective capacity. That goes right back to the types of things that we did in Chapter 5. And, um, and again, it's just taking what you learned conceptually and applying it specifically to your project, okay? Um, and then what about capacity utilization, right? So you need to calculate that. Um, if product mix has an impact, attempt to capture unit loads and effective ca capacity is as identified in tables 5, 5, and 5, 6. So again, we're just going back to chapter 5. Um, I want you to indicate your understanding of capacity waste and theoretical capacity. Again, that's just a paragraph in your project explaining to me your understanding of that. And then um, you're going to need to identify the theoretical capacity of the resource unit. Um, you may have to make some assumptions to identify your capacity waste factor. Just uh, document what those assumptions are. Okay, um, and then we want you to calculate your the theoretical capacity utilization. Okay, so, and at the end of Chapter 5, again, we have, uh, I think, it's, I'm not sure throughput is the right term there. I think, let's look here. So at the end of Chapter 5, yeah, levers for managing throughput. Right? And so then you're just going to do the exact same thing that you've done in the past, pick those levers out, address each single lever. Those actually start on page the bottom of page 110 of the textbook. Okay, um, And then do your throughput improvement mapping. Right, And so um, if you remember the throughput improvement mapping is doing that comparison of your theoretical capacity to your effective capacity, right? Hold on, let me make sure I'm saying that right. I want to I want to make sure I get them in the right order. It's your throughput to your capacity to your theoretical capacity, right? And so what should happen is your throughput, your actual throughput is going to be less than your capacity, right? And your capacity should be less than your theoretical capacity, right? But Again, what we learned is, depending on how close those are to one or another, it tells us something about where our opportunity for improvement is, mm -hmm. right? Or whether or not we need to add more resources. And so you need to apply that same conceptual component to your project, right? So where are we at with those three numbers? And then given where we're at with those three numbers, what does that tell me about my improvement? My, where, where does that indicate the improvement opportunity should be? Okay. And then it needs to be a uh, professional cohesive document. Most of you are well on board with that at this point, so it's just going to be adding this piece in, right? So um, again, I don't think it's going to be anything, you know, too earth shattering, but, and, and you may want to do it sooner rather than later because the farther we get away from Chapter 5, the harder it's going to be to remember, you know, how all that tied together. Of course, I know all of you have learned this well enough. It's going to stick with you for the rest of your life, right? That's the game plan. So, all right, any questions about Part D? No? Okay. Lovely, lovely, lovely. All right. So, Chapter 9, the actual title of it is Managing Flow Variability, right? Process Control and Process Capability. Um, and this first part of the lecture, uh, some of it comes from the textbook and some of it comes from some information on Deming. Um, I think Deming is such a sharp individual, it's interesting to look at. If you get a chance, he's got some YouTube videos out there that are just interesting to watch. Um, 
and of course, again, that bringing out the geekiness in me that I like to go. I mean, he's kind of, I think in the videos that I've seen, he looks like he's about 80, right? I think he's probably about 60 in those videos, but it's the 1950s, 1960s, kind of in through there. Okay. So our objective for this lecture is we want to say, what is quality? We want to talk about what are the tools that we use to analyze variability. And we, under we need to understand variation by reviewing the Deming Funnel Experiment. Okay. I'm going to actually have a, a YouTube video that I'm going to bring into play that we're, we'll watch some of that because I think they do a good job explaining that. Um, <clears throat> so the introduction to this chapter I think is interesting. Um, they have this overhead door manufacturer, and they're super excited because they're finishing up a really great year, right? And so internally, they've been making a lot of money, and they're focused on the fact that, you know, life is good, right? And then they have this salesperson who starts to talk about that we're not listening to the customer. Our customers aren't satisfied with our quality and our price, and they're, they're going to start looking someplace else, right? Um, so our focus in Chapter 8 was on the detrimental effects of variability on our process availability and response time, right? Chapter 9 focuses on estimating, tracking, and responding to that variability. So now that we know that we have it, how do we, how do we know that we have it, and then how do we address it, okay? So quality is, and there are a lot of different definitions out there. Okay, so recognized by a non-thinking process and therefore cannot be defined, right? I doubt if that's the one that we're going to go with, okay? That which makes anything such as it is, right? That really tells us a lot, doesn't it? Okay, fitness for use. I think we're starting to get into something that has some meaning now. Joseph Duran is the one that came up with that definition, okay? Conformance to requirements, Philip Crosby, another one of the quality gurus, okay? Closeness to the target, deviations mean loss to the society, but that's from Taguchi, okay? Providing full customer satisfaction at the most economical levels, that's Figenbaum says that. Eight dimensional, uh, so quality has these eight dimensions, performance, features, conformance, reliability, serviceability, durability, aesthetics, and perception. And that comes from Garvin, okay? And so, again, as you see, we go from top to bottom, we just start to get a little bit more specific. Like, how can we actually apply that? Well, when we think about dimensions of product quality, right, if we look at Garvin's kind of eight features, the performance features, reliability, durability, conformance, aesthetics, support responsiveness, and perceived quality. Performance, degree to which it meets or exceeds certain operating characteristics. Okay. I have I used the example of the washing machines in the in Europe in here? So, you know, if you're making washing machines, you're thinking they're going to be used to do what? Wash clothes, Wash clothes right? But in some countries in Europe, they're actually used to wash potatoes before you cook them, right? And so they were not built to withstand that type of, you know, um, movement. And that wasn't anything that they were testing for when they were building them. And so they were getting very poor quality ratings in those countries because they didn't realize how people were going to be using them, right? And so, again, it's understanding your customer and what is it that they're going to be doing with your product and what are their expectations, right? I thought that was interesting. I would have never thought to use my washing machine to wash because first off, we, we do two, so I think we can handle just <laughs> washing them as we go, right? But features, um, so what unique characteristics supplement the basic features, right? So it's not, it's above and beyond what, what's your customer looking for. Reliability, uh, sometimes people get reliability and durability confused. So reliability is when, think about starting your car, right? Um, how long can you continue to do that before you have to go in for repair, right? Durability is how long until you can no longer use the product, period, right? Reliability says I go out to start my car and it starts every time. Durability says I can use this product for 10 years and then it's, and then it's worn out, okay? Conformance, again, I, I always like the conformance to requirements. It's the degree to which the design specifications are met, right? So you've designed it a particular way. Is it actually, does it actually meet those specifications? Aesthetics, how does it look, feel, sound, taste, or smell? In a 
service operation, you're talking more about what are the facilities like, the equipment, the personnel, and the communication. Um, support and responsiveness, installation information, maintenance or repair, right? Willingness to help and prompt service. So like my favorite story there is when my Hewlett Packard, when I was in the PhD program, and I had it for one year and one week, and it crashed and burned. And when I tried to call Hewlett Packard for repair and help, they wouldn't even talk to me until I would give them a credit card number because I was one year and one week past the, I was one week past the um, service date on it. And I ne I've never bought a Hewlett Packard since. I mean, it's just one of those things. I'm like, you won't even talk to me. No, ma'am, you must give me your credit card number. No, I must not. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, perceived quality, right? So you know, you can all probably pick a brand or two. Who, what brands come to mind when you think of high quality? Apple. Apple, right? Troy, what about you? Any any particular brand come to mind? Uh, I don't really know. Khalid, anything come to mind? For what? High quality brands. Uh, Apple, maybe. Yeah. Apple, yeah. There's others. Who? What other ones are there out there? I mean. Apple's the easy one. That's I'm going to make you think harder than that this morning. Who else besides Apple do you think of? Like when you buy shoes, is there a particular shoe manufacturer that you like? Nike, right? In my day, it was Adidas. That was kind of the... So those white shoes with the three black stripes on them? Just so you know, I wore those when I was in high school. And I was cool. I was not cool, but I did wear those shoes. <laughs> okay, so again, again, it, that perceived quality can kind of come along with it. You sort of get, I find it interesting from a personal, when you talk about intangible, when I went to a manage in St. Louis, right, it's the first time I've ever been a manager, okay, there was no perception of perceived quality there. I had to earn every iota of it, right, because I had no history. And that was really interesting to me when I moved from St. Louis to Denver. There were a lot of things that they just granted that you knew and understood how to do because I'd already been a manager someplace else, right? I was like, this is so much easier, you know? <laughs> just you have to get through that first hurdle of, okay, now you've got a little bit of meat behind you. But that first one in St. Louis, every single day seemed like it was an uphill, like you had to prove yourself, you know? So again, um, examples of perceived quality. All right. So the, um, a lot of people will define um, quality or lack of quality in terms of gaps or variations. So what is the actual minus what's the expected? And when those don't match, we think about those being a gap. And so we have different areas that we can look for those gaps. Your customer need versus your product design, right? So that washing machine example is customer need versus product design. It wasn't designed to do what they wanted to do with it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> product design versus process capability, right? Does is your um, is your product design? Let's say that you have somebody who wants a particular product that's a, a particular length, but your process is designed to maybe have plus or minus a half an inch, and they need plus or minus an eighth of an inch, right? Your product design is not going to meet process capability, okay? And then process capability versus process performance, okay? Well, now, you know, are we in control or not in control? Can our process do what we said that our customer wants it to do? Process performance versus product performance. Okay, our process can do what we want it to do, but does that actually deliver that desired result? Okay, and then product performance versus cu customer perception. They have a couple of examples um, in the textbook, and I think when we start to talk about variation, um, the one example that they talk about is the sharpshooter example on the top of page 232. Okay. So if his or her shots on average hit the bullseye, but they're widely dispersed around it, we would say that they're accurate but imprecise. Right? Right. On the other hand, his or her shots hit the, almost the exact same spot every time, but it's off target. Okay? Um, so he's precise, but he's inaccurate. And it's easier to fix the precise but inaccurate than it is to fix the accurate but imprecise because you can probably adjust the sight 
and he's going to be right on target then, right? The other one where you're widely dispersed around it, it's harder to, to actually get that into, into control, okay? Um, <clears throat> but each of the, the bullet points on the slide represent a possible gap that ultimately can lead to customer dissatisfaction or lower quality, okay? All right, so here's some of our quality thought leaders, Deming, Duran, Crosby, and Amay. When I was at Pella in Denver, or not Pella, sorry, when I was at Burnham in Denver, what uh, we were on the Philip Crosby uh, program. And um, what I know is that Deming is the one that really talks about management has to be on board with it. And what we would do is we would, what we would say is we would talk the talk and we would act like we were going to do it, but when it came to putting money into anything, the organization was not invested in doing that. And so you can only go so far unless you're willing to invest some money into it, right? And um, and Deming kind of hits that pretty hard. He's he's saying management is responsible for quality, and um, you have to drive it, you have to be willing to invest in it, and you have to have top management invested in the idea of it in order for it to work. Um, but, I mean, this quality is free, zero defects, focus on incremental change. I can remember being, you know, about 27, 28 years old, walking around, talking that talk because we'd had the training, and then you'd go to implement some change, and as soon as it was going to take even $3,000 to implement the change, like, oh, no, no, sorry, we don't have that money to invest. And it's like, you know, you might as well not do it if, if that's going to be your approach. It's almost demoralizing to people to start something like that and then realize they don't really mean it. So anyway, so here's some of our, our quality thought leaders. Deming says it's holistic view of responsibility for quality. Variability is the source of most of our problems, and it's, it's what the customer wants that's important, and we need to stay focused on that. Duran broadened the definition of quality. He says focus on change management and the cost of quality analysis. Crosby says quality is free. Uh, zero defects is what you're, you're striving for, and you're focusing on incremental change. Uh, MA is one that helped develop the Kaizen system of continuous improvement, intensely process-oriented view, heavy dependence on frontline worker insights, and that emphasis on worker training and development. So Crosby I worked with when I was at Burnham. Um, MA, I did not know it at the time, but the Pella system is heavily based on that continuous improvement, Kaizen, right? And then Deming just is kind of that fundamental un foundation for all of, all of that. Um, Deming's got a pretty interesting history too. You know, he, he ended up working in Japan because when we came back from World War II, we were not necessarily interested in quality because uh, the kind of the approach at that point is if you make it, they will buy it, right? There's just, there's just this focus on, and so we lost out early on on the quality movement. We were behind the curve in the 70s and 80s because other countries had been heavily focused on it, and we just weren't because we didn't think we needed it, right? Um, <clears throat> but what you'll find is, um, and, and I think in particular Deming's perspective, has this inverted view of management, right? Um, so the traditional organizational structure says you've got your employees kind of as that lower base level, lower, li lower level mid-management, and then middle management, and then top management, right? And what Deming would say is flip that over, and, at, and it's kind of, I don't know that it directly equates, but it's something that servant style of leadership. My job as a top manager is to remove barriers so you can do what you need to do. And so how can I help do that? right? Not my job as a top manager is to tell you what you're going to do because that's how we're going to win, right? My job is to help you and get out of your way, right? That's, um, and so very kind of different approaches, okay? Um, these are ones that I think are important that you understand. Um, so this prevention cost, these different costs of quality, prevention, appraisal, internal, and external, okay? Um, and so, I kind of divide them into the top two and the bottom two. Um, so the bottom two are about when it goes wrong, right? Where does it go wrong? Internal failure costs say it happens inside the factory before it goes to the customer, and external are after delivery to the customer, okay? And it's not too far from the truth to 
you can think of it in terms of if you catch something, a quality issue on the production line, it can cost you <coughs> pennies, right, to, to stop and repair it. If you capture something after it's been produced and packed but not shipped, it can cost you dollars to go out and fix it, right? You have to go out. So I'll use the Pella window example. If we would find a, a quality problem and we had packed it out, you can think of having to go out and take all the packing off, repair the window, and put it back together, right? It's probably, depending on the type of repair, it's probably going to take 5 to $10 a window to go out and do that, okay? Maybe not even quite that much, but close, okay? And so then think about if it ships to Lowe's, our customer, but it hasn't gone all the way to the final customer. Now we're into hundreds of dollars because now we have to go, we have to send someone to Lowe's to go repair. And oh, by the way, it's probably multiple Lowe's. It's probably not just one. It's, it's in different locations. And then, of course, the very last one, so now we're into those external failure costs. We're outside the facility. You know, it can be hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? We had um, some custom doors that we installed in a place in, up in Colorado. What's one of the big ski places up there? Is it Vail? And so um, beautiful country, right? Um, and we would install these custom wood doors, okay? Well, you don't think of it as a problem except that these custom wood doors were installed around a beautiful swimming pool. So the inside was really damp and moist, and the outside was super dry, and so the doors just kept warping, right? And so, um, so that, was, that was a problem, and I think we replaced them four times before we had to say, this is never going to work. The, the conditions for a swimming pool and the dry, that's just never, that's not going to work for a wood door. And then um, other ones, if you have installation problems, and you think about like on a window and it runs water down the inside of the wall, now you have to replace maybe the whole wall or maybe you've got mold problems in multiple places in the home, right? And so then, again, you can be into thousands of, upon thousands depending on how serious that issue is. So that's internal, external, and kind of the degree of cost that's associated with that. So why it's important that you do quality checks and that your people are, are informed about why that's important. The other two costs are prevention and appraisal, and they're just slightly different in their approach, okay? So prevention says, I'm going to do quality training once a week with my team, and I'm going to shut the production line down for 10 minutes, and we're going to talk about quality. And every week out of the year, I'm going to take 10 minutes. Well, if you've got 700 employees to sit, stop for 10 minutes once a week, that's a pretty major investment, right? Um, and then appraisal is, okay, now I'm going to do something to inspect to make sure that the product is accurate before it leaves. So appraisal-wise, um, one of the things that we did is we had at the Story City plant, we had an eye, this is so cool when they could do this, that could tell whether the cladding was brown, white, or tan because that was one of the biggest mistakes we have is we would ship it out with the wrong color cladding on the outside of it, right? And so that eye would go, you know, beep red and go, nope, you got to stop, you got a problem, this your product part number does not match the visually what it's seeing, okay? And that's appraisal. It's just how do I, how do I check that? Another one of those is um, every Pella production line is required to do so many quality checks, like every manager is required to do that. So I would be required to go out and pick maybe two or three random windows every day and go, I'm going to inspect that one, that one, and that one. Right? That's an appraisal cost. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go inspect that and we would have like a twenty or thirty point checklist and we'd have to go down and check and make sure everything was like it was supposed to be. That's oftentimes if we had issues where we'd find we'd have to go, nope, we have to go out and we have to we have to either inspect or check or fix, you know, a certain until we can prove that we no longer have that quality issue. Okay. <clears throat> Some people say quality is free. Philip Crosby. I'm not a huge believer in that. Um, I think that you're striving for zero defects, but at some point um, you have to assess whether or not, you know, the value. Um, one of the examples I can give is if you look at that door glass, right, from right here, from where any of you are sitting, I would be surprised if you can see any scratches, dents, or, or issues in the glass, right? Um, however, if I stand two inches from the glass and inspect it in daylight, I could probably find some blemishes, right? And so at what point are you going to reject that glass? When do you say, 
okay, it no longer meets, right? We had some pretty interesting conversations about that. And what we landed on is at three feet in normal light, if the average person can't pick out the defect, then you let it go, right? And so I would go, Miranda, I'm going to come up to you. I've got this piece of glass. I want you to look. What do you see? Right? Miranda's like, yeah, I can't see anything. Great. Thank you. Right? <laughs> and then if, <clears throat> you know, because we, we, you have different operators who have different beliefs, right? And so they want, they're usually really good operators, the ones that want perfection, right? And they'd be like, no, look, there's a, there's a scratch right here. Okay, yeah, there is a scratch. But Miranda from three feet away in normal lighting can't see that scratch. And it would have, you know, it had restrictions on how long the scratch could be or how, or how many, right? There was, there was some restrictions on that. But you have to be very specific about what your quality is going to be because otherwise you can reject everything because you can find issues with it, right? But there's this <clears throat> sweet spot, right? And so um, there's a cost of nonconformance, like if it doesn't work, what happens? Right? And then there's a cost of appraisal, that appraisal and prevention. So cost of nonconformance is going to be your internal and external costs, and your cost of assurance is going to be the appraisal and prevention. And you, you can overdo it, right? You can try to inspect way too much, and so there's trying to find, okay, what's that sweet spot for us? Okay? And so we use, once we find issues, right, we have um, quality, we use the quality improvement process. And the PDCA is Plan, Do, Check, Act, right? All of you who've had 350 have heard of that. And so um, there's a couple of different ways to go about it. And what you see is, um, well, let's do this. You start by measuring your variation, okay? And then you um, analyze that variation. And then you try to figure out how you can control that variation. And then once you have it controlled, how can you improve it to reduce that variation? Okay. Or you can look at innovation and redesign the process. And so what you've got here, kind of, if don't lose sight of this, right? Here we're trying to figure out how to control it. Now that we've controlled it, we're going to improve it. Continuous improvement a little at a time, right? No major shakeups there, just a little continual improvement. Okay, then when we innovate, we get this big jump up in terms of our quality and now that we've innovated and revised the process, okay, and then once we control it at that level again, then we work on the continuous improvement. And once we kind of get what we would call, there comes a point when you have done as much continuous improvement and you've hit most of the low-hanging fruit, right? And so continuing to try to do continuous improvement, you're probably going to get some bang for your buck, but not nearly as much the first time or two that you work continuous improvement. And so then what you say is, okay, now we have to, if we're going to make major improvements, we're going to have to figure out an innovation. How do we actually change the process to move it up? Okay. And that's a pretty solid approach um, in manufacturing in particular in terms of how improvements are made. So we talked earlier about the difference between process control versus process capability, and I think it's really important that you understand that difference. Process control has that internal focus of identifying and eliminating abnormal. Notice that's bolded and italicized, and that's going to be a lot of what kind of the last part of this lecture is about, is about abnormal variability, thereby maintaining the process in a stable state of statistical equilibrium. Process capability, on the other hand, measures how well the process output meets those external customer requirements. So every process has variability in it. The key is to separate out the normal variability from the abnormal variability. And you want to make corrections on the abnormal variability and, oh, by the way, have the maturity to know that you don't make corrections for normal variability, okay, because it actually uh, can create more problems for you, okay? So the importance of metrics, why do we measure things? When you measure what you were speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. That's Lord Kelvin back in 1824 to 1907. Galileo said, you count what is countable, measure what is measurable, and what is not measurable, you make it measurable, right? Figure out a way to, to measure it. Sherlock Holmes and the Adventure of Copper Beaches. Data, data, data. I can't make bricks without clay. I need to have the data. 
This is the favorite one around Pella, or at least it used to be. And God we trust, everybody else has to bring data, right? All right. So we're going to talk about a variety of different quality improvement tools <clears throat> that are out there. Um, I'm just going to, I think we've got an individual slide on these, so I'm going to fly through this slide pretty fast. We have a histogram, right? We have a cause and effect analysis, which is also called a fishbone diagram, which is also called, do you know what the third one is? Yeah, but... Ishikawa diagram? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then we have check sheets. And we have Pareto analysis, right? And so, I like I said, I think I've got individual on that. Continued, we've got scatter diagrams, right? We have process capability analysis. We have process flow analysis. And we have process control charts, okay? So let's talk about check sheets. They are so handy because you want your operators to not have to spend a ton of time to analyze things, right? You don't want them have to have to write down high pressure issue 310 on that. You want them to go, yep, had an issue. Right? and just be able to check it off and move on. Okay. Pareto charts, they have that 80-20 rule. Right? And if you think about it, um, so let me give you the example. Let's just use 100,000 products are sold. Right? That's your annual sales. Okay? And you have uh, 50 customers. Okay? But your top two customers are 80,000 units of your sales, right? Who should you focus your time and efforts on making sure that you're keeping satisfied, right? Those two customers that are 80% of your business. And what you'll find is that it's the other 48 customers who are less than 20% of your business that take up a ton of your time. And even as a manager, I can tell you when I had that, when I was working at Pella in Shenandoah, I had 40 employees on my production line, and I found myself dealing with the two that were the worst employees all of the time, and hardly spending the time I needed with the, the others that were really doing a great job. And I can just tell you, I made a conscious decision to go, I'm done with that. Those two don't deserve all my time. These other 38 that are doing what they need to do, that's where I need to be focusing my energy and efforts. And at that point, you start doing the counseling to, there's another bus that's a better fit for those people, right? That's kind of, that was the, there's a seat on the bus for everybody, but sometimes you're not on the right bus. Have you ever heard that, that saying before? So, so anyway, that 80-20 rule is something when you're trying to think about how you're managing, make sure you're focusing on the things that are important, right? And it's not to say, because if you've ever heard um, the lady that makes the chocolate chip cookies, um, what is her name? It's a brand of chocolate chip cookies. And she talks about, you know, when she started out, she couldn't hardly get people to talk to her to sell her supplies. And... You know, now she's this huge national brand, and she won't go back and do business with those people that wouldn't talk to her. So there's a balance, right? You've got to figure out, you've got to address them somehow, but you can't, uh, you can't go overboard there either. Okay. So Pareto charts are a bar chart that plots the frequencies of occurrence. It's often beneficial to track issues both based on incident count and dollars of impact. Um, the 80-20 Pareto principle just implies that 20% of the problem types account for 80% of all occurrences. So even from a quality standpoint, what you're saying is <clears throat> pick your top two issues. And a lot of times if you address your top two issues, you've addressed 80% of your problem, right? And so, again, it's important to make sure that you're focused on the right things. Um, and it's always, I also encourage people to do it both by incidence and by dollar value, right? Because both are important. Incidents are how many customers you're affecting, and dollar value is bottom line to the corporation. So you should look at it in both ways. Okay? Um, a histogram is a bar chart that displays the frequency distribution of an observed performance metric. For example, in this uh, table 9.3, shows the frequency of the weight of the overhead doors. And so it can be displayed with labels on the bars, which might show the percentage that a particular bar represents of the total. Um, so in essence, you're trying to represent 100% of the individual points of data. Although a histogram summarizes the overall performance in the aggregate, it does not show how it varies over time. So information that is often useful in identifying and reducing variability. So again, we don't have a time reference here. We just have a, here's how many incidents actually occur. 
A run chart, on the other hand, plots some measure of performance over time. So now we can see, okay, well, when I plotted it at 9 a.m., here's where it was at, 10 a.m., 11 a.m., maybe you're catching one. Um, and it helps kind of look and see, do we have any trends going on? What are our trends that we have? This multivariate, it's a multivariable chart, and basically it shows you um, across the bottom, let's say we're looking at day two, it's going to show you the average of the output on day two, and it's going to show you the range because it's going to show you the high and the low, right? And so, again, I think that's a pretty valuable, quick visual look at what's happening, okay? Um, and so, basically, they start talking about, you're talking about the variance of within and between, right? And so, again, kind of coming back to some of our, of our statistical concepts, within a per particular day, What's the range that I've got going on? And that's going to be the range from high to low. And between is going to be, okay, where are the means at? And what's the difference between the mean of one day to the next? Okay? So you're trying to just isolate different types of variability. Okay, so over-controlling a process. Um, I think what I want to do is, I'm going to vary from what I've done before. I think what I'm going to do... I've got a um, YouTube video that actually covers kind of the same material that I'm going to cover. Let me just do a quick. You can read through these slides, but she covers this pretty well. And we're going to cover process control charts in another lecture. So that being said, let me go ahead and bring up that YouTube video. I'm Meredith Hartley from Me Squared Solutions, and I'm going to explain variation and Nelson's funnel experiment to you today. This is part of the Certified Quality Improvement Associate prep course for the American Society for Quality exam, and we base our courses off of the Quality Council of Indiana's material. There will always be variation. Variation is any differentiation or change or deviation from a norm. The key question shouldn't be, why is this variation happening? Oh no, we have variation, what should we do? It should be, is this variation normal for the process or is something weird happening? And we really need to do something because this is a problem. Variation is broken into two different categories. There's common variation and special variation. Common variation is stuff you expect to happen. It's normal human error or a normal part of the system. It's the example we have is, your commute is going to vary every day because traffic lights are going to be a little bit different and weather is going to change. That's normal variation. You expect that to happen. You might speed up a little, you might slow down, totally normal. Special variation is the unexpected. It's not typical. It's an anomaly or a sign that something's broken. For instance, getting in a car accident or having your car break down on you on your way to work changes the length of your commute because it's a special cause a variation. It's something that's abnormal. You didn't expect it to happen. Most common cause variation is totally harmless. You expect it to happen and you need to accept that that's always going to be part of your process. It's impossible to eliminate all variation. You just have to have healthy variation. The only time that common cause variation becomes unhealthy is if there's too much of it and it makes the system unstable. For example, it's okay to be late, just a couple minutes late to work. Say your commute varies by one or two minutes and that's no big deal. But if you're the manager of a company and you realize that all of your employees are getting to late to school, sorry, getting to work um, half an hour 
to 15 minutes to 45 minutes late because the city has grown so much, traffic has gotten so bad, that's a case where common cause variation has become a problem. And in this case, the employer might decide to start offering bus passes or subway passes because they know that that will take the strain off their workers. They won't have to stress about driving into work anymore. It'll make it affordable and they'll be able to get to work dependably because those buses and those trains go on a pretty solid schedule. That's an example of healthily addressing common cause variation when it gets to be too out of control. Special cause variation requires two responses. It's usually a problem that needs an immediate response, and then you have to make a long-term change to the system to prevent it from happening again. The example we use here is that your car breaks down on the way to work, probably because you forgot to change the oil. Immediately, you have to call a tow truck and get a ride to work. That's the immediate change you need to make to address that special cause variation. But in the long term, you probably need to schedule regular maintenance and change your system for taking care of your car to make sure that doesn't happen again. That's a case of unhealthy special cause variation that needs that kind of, of addressing. Now, special cause variation isn't always bad. Sometimes you discover something awesome. Maybe there's construction on the way to work, so you discover a detour that actually gets you to work faster. That's a special cause that actually had a positive effect and you want to understand it so you can duplicate it. So not all special cause variation is bad. Quality gets worse when managers change the system unnecessarily for common cause variation. So for that harmless, normal human error that you expect, that's the humans changing or the system being slightly different, the machine needing a little more oil, that kind of stuff. That's harmless common cause variation and you shouldn't change things because of it. Lloyd S. Nelson was a statistician. He died just last year. And he came up with an experiment to show managers how they were actually making quality worse every time they changed the system unnecessarily. And what he had them do is they took a funnel, like the one that you'll see here on your screen, and they dropped a marble into the funnel and let it fall on a piece of paper where it would make a mark. And they were supposed to aim the funnel over a target. So they put the funnel, oh, let's go back a second. They would put the funnel right over this target right here, and then they'd drop the marble and let it leave a mark. And the idea was you do this over and over again until you ended up with a chart that looked a lot like this, with a lot of little marks all around the target. You use this to show that's normal variation. It's going to happen. Most of the marks are going to be relatively close together. That's normal, regular human variation. Nelson used this to identify four rules for how human beings respond to harmless change and end up hurting quality. There are these four cases. This is from the uh, Quality Council of Indiana's CQIA primer, and I'm going to go through each one and explain them to you. In case one, the variation just happens. You don't change anything, if you just keep dropping those marbles, and the results stay pretty much the same. They're pretty close to the target. You can predict that a drop is going to be within this area. That's a stable system. The results are predictable. In case two, the idea was that every time a mark wasn't perfectly on target, you take that funnel and you'd move it an equal distance in the opposite direction. So every time that you dropped a marble here, you'd say, oh dear, I'm too far away from the mark. Let me try moving it over this direction. Maybe then I'll hit the mark. And then when you don't, you move it the opposite direction and the opposite direction, over and over again, constantly trying to hit that mark. And when that happens, the amount of variation increases about 40% he found. You're actually making the situation worse by overcorrecting. In case three, the idea was that he saw people put the funnel over the target again. So they would accidentally hit right here and they'd re-aim for that target right in the middle. But then they'd have a second, a second thought. They'd second guess themselves. And they'd do exactly what number two did. They would overcorrect and move the funnel over here. And what happens is the results keep getting further and further apart and more and more unpredictable. In these cases, variation gets progressively worse and unpredictable because you're overcorrecting instead of aiming for the target. In case number four, he noticed that people, instead of trying to aim for the target, started aiming for their last drop. 
So each time they dropped something here, which was pretty close to the target, instead of re-aiming for the very center, they'd aim for the last dot, and they'd get a little further off. And then they'd aim for the next, for that dot, and they'd get a little further off, and a little further off, until they got progressively farther and farther away from the target. Now, real world, world examples of these would be um, in case two, where they kept getting just slightly farther away and were unpredictable. This would be if a factory adjusted their machinery every time there was any variation in the process. If every time there was a dissatisfied customer, they changed the entire system. If every time there was an electrical surge, you completely tried to rewire or did an audit and tried to fix the system. Normal variation is normal variation. If you change the system, you're actually introducing more variation into the system. An example of case number four would be if instead of every time a factory made a product, instead of comparing it to the original product they were trying to make more of, they compared it to the last one and the last one and the last one. Think of it like a telephone game. Instead of going back to the source every time and comparing what you've done to the source, you're comparing it to what the last person told you and the last person told them. And those mistakes get magnified. That's what you can see, excuse me, in this chart right here. You can see that they get farther and farther away from the target each time. Another example um, is this happens when a, a poorly trained worker is given responsibility to train a new employee. And they pass on their mistakes that were never caught. And then those get magnified as the next employee makes mistakes. And then they pass all of those on to the next employee. And the next employee, when management doesn't get involved and doesn't remind people what needs to happen and take responsibility for training people, quality suffers. In all of these cases, quality got worse because they adjusted a stable process unnecessarily. That's the real point of Nelson's funnel experiment. Deming called this tampering, where normal variation over here in case one, is treated like special cause variation, as if there's something major happening and we have to change everything. The importance for the CQIA exam is to understand what Nelson's funnel experiment was proving, which is human behavior with common cause variation, how unnecessary changes hurt quality. That's the most important thing to know for the exam. Also to know what each of these graphs are an example of that case two is an example of someone adjusting to try to compensate for being a little bit off and each time moving a distance away from the target, that case three is overcompensating, and case four is comparing your current result to the last result instead of to the standard that you want to achieve. Uh, there you go. So I'm curious, did you guys have that? Did you guys do the dimming experiment? Did you talk about that? Yeah. Did yeah the quincunx? What's that? The quincunx or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. I still I didn't hear. It. Quincunx is that how you yeah. say it? Experiment. It's like the little like the you know like with the like plinko kind of thing. Uh huh. It goes like that. Uh huh. And so he would do the same thing but with the funnel and he'd like move it one to one side or the other to try to but it would like it would plot it as like histograms you could like see it right. easier. see the results of that that's cool I should ask him for that <laughs> so I'll just kind of let me just scroll through these real quick but I think what she did I had a different example that I was using but I think she covered most of that so again we talked about common cause and special cause I think that's the key one of the keys to come out of that um, and then the problem then is how do you determine if it's common cause or special cause and that's what control charts are for and that's what we're going to pick up on on Thursday right today's Tuesday <laughs> on Thursday we're going to talk about control charts and then on the following Tuesday we'll talk about process capability so the assignment today is going to have something to do with the this last kind of part of the lecture and, and those four different cases so um, it'll just be kind of reviewing that make sure you have an understanding of that and then we'll have problems associated with Thursdays and Tuesdays lectures all right any questions for me all right well, you guys have a great couple of days and I'll see you back here on Thursday <laughs>